Hello, everybody, and welcome to our fifth lecture on urban development and planetary health. We're really happy that you're joining us again this afternoon or whatever time it is at your place. And today we're talking about cities as drivers for change, because the majority of people on the planet are now living in cities already, and therefore cities have or face really great opportunities to improve health of populations and to reduce global health, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, I wanted to say, and also prepare for health risks accelerated by climate change. And I'm really happy to have three fantastic speakers for this lecture today. And we're going to start with Anna Dyson. So I'll give a short introduction and then I'll hand over to you. And afterwards, we are listening to Olga Semiente and Thomas Matreider, but we will get an introduction on them later when it's their turn. So Anna, it's really nice to have you here this afternoon. So you're professor of architecture at the School of Architecture and also professor of forestry and environmental studies at Yale and also founding director of the Yale Center for Ecosystems and Architecture. So all these names already say like that you're working in a very interdisciplinary field. And um, also it says like you're on the forefront of when it comes to, and I need to read this out, reinventing the DNA of the built fabric, which sounds really also really interesting. And a short anecdote, maybe I guess you all know the three of you, at least Jan Giel. He's an architect and also very well known for his book, um, Making Cities for People, which is talking about it, exactly this connection between humans and built environment. And he got his idea to writing this book from his wife, actually, who's a psychologist. And he was, uh, no, she was asking him once, like, you're building all these fancy buildings, your architects, but why aren't you building all these buildings for the humans who are supposed to live in there? So what I wanted to show with this anecdote is that it's not so obvious that architects are working in this field of humans, built environment and non-human living ecosystems. And my question to you, Anna, is to start, how did you kind of end up in this field? Oh, that. That's a great uh, question. It's so hard to know. You kind of follow your nose from one thing to the next. I um, I would just say that maybe, you know, initially, even as a student, um, you know, being very dissatisfied with knowing that the systems that we have been creating are really sort of created from the standpoint of very anthropocentric goals. We didn't use that term back then, but we can look at in hindsight uh, that it really you know, the sort of extended ecosystems or, you know, the place within which we, we live wasn't really considering non-human living systems. And I think that, um, you know, I was interested in a, maybe a broader sort of conception of what um, architecture and urbanism is uh, and that urbanism and, archit and, and buildings don't necessarily have to push out other species that we can actually design with and for also um, biodiversity and other species. Maybe because I was a camper as a kid, I don't know. <laughs> I think actually that uh, that's part of the reason for many people that they also have something already like in their early years that inspires them. So yeah, I think I would hand over to you and also say to the audience, feel free to ask questions if you have any, because we do the Q&A directly after Anna's talk. Okay, so I'm going to do something a bit different given the, the time that we have. Um, I'm going to uh, present from our website um, a few little clips and then um, talk about really, once again, this theme of reconsidering completely uh, what place in which we're designing or creating our, our space within which we live um, and how we might reconsider that. Um, I think as many of you know, maybe the COVID pandemic has brought into high relief the fact that our indoor environments actually long before the pandemic, were probably not uh, the best for our health and well-being. Um, and yet we spend over 90% of our time uh, indoors. So when we're talking about, when we're looking at the earth from a satellite, for example, really what we see um, with light pollution or airflow patterns or whatever, we're, we're looking at basically drivers for how we organize as a material society. But ultimately what we're doing is creating these lives um, that are sort of indoor climates that are completely separated from all of the other systems 
and living species that we co-evolved over millions of years to cohabit with. And another piece that I wanna sort of theme that I wanna to touch on today is that while it might seem in in inevitable, uh, the way that we do things, look at all this, pour, uh, this concrete that's been poured into this site, seems rather inevitable and possibly impossible to replace. Uh, none of this was here 100 years ago. And if history has shown us anything, it's that the way that we do things, there's nothing inevitable about them, and that actually things will look very different in possibly 100, 200, certainly 500 years. So what we like to do is maybe take the long view and start to think about both time and space in much larger time frame. And one of those principles is not only to see our own human health and well-being as inextricably linked to biodiverse ecosystems in which we live, but also to consider the value of what we do as either costing or adding to the work of the biogeosphere. So that means our, the work of our planet. So I'm just going to play this quick uh, two clip, two minute clip. Sorry, my dog decided to add up to this. Accelerating at an exponential rate. Instead of looking at this as a catastrophe, we could look at this as a tremendous opportunity. This pavilion itself was 3D printed with host waste bamboo and bound with bio binders. And so it's a test to see how far we can go using solar energy and clean energy means to print buildings with waste products. We evolved to coexist with natural systems. And so we really need to find solutions to replace steel and concrete in the environment so that we don't have to suffocate our natural environments with concrete and steel. Another great thing about these biological materials is that they sequester carbon throughout their lifetime. So they're basically doing a tremendous amount to reduce carbon emissions towards climate change effects. So, so in, in that theme that I just introduced, oh my goodness. In that theme that I just introduced um, is the first sort of, um, uh, sort of theme that I'd like to talk about today, which is that ultimately all of our technologies and everything that we do in terms of how we metabolize water, food, um, uh, energy, um, air quality, how we process our air quality, it, they're all sort of at the, um, uh, at the basis of a material culture. And the first principle um, to, to the way that we would like to start looking at um, materials is to think about them, as I said, in a kind of life cycle. And I think this is interesting maybe for those in life sciences um, to know that we also think about um, the, material, um, the materials that we use um, as a function of, I'm just gonna um, show this again, sorry. Uh, the, that this, we, we think about it as a function of, um, uh, of how those materials are procured and then how they exist over the course of their life cycle. Um, and, and basically, um, uh, one of the things that we're looking for is, um, does that material life cycle, and this is where I'm, I'll, I'll sort of show a few instances, does it sit within um, the overall metabolism of how we organize, uh, how we pr procure, for example, our food and our water. So that we look at the nexus across all of those things, the materials, the water, et cetera. And so for example, we want to look at circular material economies where our waste can equal our food. And this is really a little bit of a back to the future because if we think about urban um, environments from the past, they were continuously in a kind of natural cycle with their agricultural lands that supported it. You can think about like night soils leaving the city and replenishing agricultural lands and then uh, food coming in during the day. Here what we are seeing is uh, um, a, a wall that is basically built. Uh, it has higher um, material strength properties than concrete or steel uh, for certain applications, but it's actually made out of a combination of post-agricultural waste from coconut coir using the resins in the coconut, um, soy bio binder, so soybean bio binders, and, and mycelia, which is um, mushrooms, to bound uh, these um, very, very strong um, panels at low heat. So basically, if you can imagine that instead of having to import all that steel and concrete that we saw from the, um, 
uh, from other uh, uh, territories or, or around the globe. Um, very bad for the life cycle um, or for the for the carbon footprint of the materials that you could actually procure large scale materials off of the side of farms and they, they can be printed they can be um, brought into 3D printers that are basically solar driven so here we can see um, uh, a, a large pavilion that in this case it's made out of this is up at that UNEP headquarters that was part of the video that I just saw and it's showing a pavilion that is uh, um, made from post uh, bamboo waste um, uh, sort of bamboo farming um, for food and for uh, structural materials and all sorts of finishes and other things. But then there's tremendous amounts of waste products, just like with the coconut and uh, rice and uh, all agricultural products have a lot of a lot of non uh, sort of recyclable waste or stuff that might even be poured into the oceans. Um, and this, you can start to say th things getting a bit bigger, right? More the the, the size of a um, of a building. Um, and while this might seem like a very extravagant process from the standpoint of our current material economies that are basically, you know, throughput, we, we make things in factories or we, we, we pour things on site. On sides of farms, you have a lot of solar energy, you have a lot of waste, and you also have a lot of time uh, and space. So you have the opposite things that you need uh, really to construct cities in our previous material economy. And so what we're looking at really, here is also um, some images in this um, pavilion um, exhibition of next generation solar, where we're also looking at the material life cycle. We're looking at replacing semiconductor panels with just very earth abundant materials like bioplastics or glass. Um, and, and, and using them for high efficiency solar in order to basically drive processes, starting with, let's say, the, um, um, uh, the, the pavilion itself. Um, and for example, another really radical innovation in sort of the way that we might procure healthy biocompatible bio materials for uh, buildings is that these 3D printing machines, they can literally reproduce themselves <laughs> through processes so that we can start to think about highly distributed material economies uh, that are in a sense rural based, but have a very different relationship between rural to urban, both in terms of um, the, uh, the gestation of food, but also all of the material and, um, and, 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 and water and, and energy. So in this case, our colleague here from the University of Nairobi is sitting on a bench um, and that is a thermal electric bench. So this is also a kind of high tech, low tech uh, situation where we have a bench that literally switchably, um, it takes um, solar energy and it can switchably in an instant switch from hot to cold, depending on what the body needs. So this is another big principle that I would offer is that for future material environments, we would like to um, heat and cool them. Um, we, as, as I think um, in the introduction was saying, we build buildings and cities for human beings, not for spaces. So we want to heat and cool and, and keep people comfortably, not spaces. Every single person has a different uh, thermal comfort expectation in terms of what kind of uh, what they need. And so we would want to really tailor all of those things, um, you sort of airstream, thermal comfort and, and, and things. So this is, you know, a, a constellation of different um, uh, um, uh, different technologies that were um, exhibited there. And I encourage you for future information, if you'd like to go into our publications, this is our website, you can get much further information. Um, but another um, thing that I'd like to, um, uh, uh, to get into a little bit, which is just how do we think about um, buildings from the standpoint of human health and well-being? Well, we know that humans are bioresponsive. Um, this is a good example here of how we misuse daylighting, for example, that we really, really need in our built environment. But what do we need? We basically need dynamic interfaces with daylight, with wind, with um, humidity. And so in the future, our technologies will not be static. We can basically call the pattern that we need, whether or not we need, we, we want to generate power with the incoming solar, whether or not we want to daylight our space, what, do we want to create patterns, do we want to create information. So these are all images of a kind of dynamic interface. Um, instead of having a static wall, you would have an interface between you and uh, whatever bioclimatic flows are in your ambient environment. And that's a really very, very important emerging area, which is in the, the field of, of smart materials and advanced, so-called advanced uh, materials, multifunctional materials that allow for this kind of engagement, you know, between the human being and 
all of the requirements. We've already said that no two people will have the same preferences. So um, these are just looking at some experiments of what happens when many people put input their preferences. A lot of times the patterns can become very unexpected and biomorphic. That's part of our research to really understand that um, uh, basically as a social condition. Um, some interesting you know, research that uh, comes out of um, uh, a lot of those bioresponsive facades, which is that um, in addition to no two people wanting or needing the same thing, let's say, um, in terms of light quality or, or thermal, um, we find in the, the data acquisition, so data acquisition is a big aspect of what we do as well, that even when the body is in phys physiological distress thermally, and it's showing that, sometimes a user or, or an occupant will report satisfaction or preference. So uh, we can't always go based on sort of quantitative metrics. The subjective is a really, really important aspect. Lastly, I'll just also, there's many um, uh, projects on our website that you can take a look at, but I'd like to um, touch here on the Botswana Technology Hub. Um, I'm trying to click on it, I apologize. But um, with this, this tech hub, um, this is also looking at a district scale up where we're looking at the relationship between multiple buildings and the surrounding district. And why I bring this one up, and um, I encourage you, my time is almost up, I think about three minutes, but you can look at many of these, maybe ecological living module wall is a smaller one, um, but in, you know, we, we can either look at like, so the built environment is multi-scalar. We can either look at a small uh, module. In this case, this is the size of a um, of a um, uh, this is the size of a um, of a family of uh, sorry a refugee unit for a family of four that we're we're developing um, a program with the United Nations Environmental Program um, and. Uh, uh, and, and so basically for a family of four um, in a refugee condition, this is really looking at the absolute minimum requirements that you need. And uh, one of the important things about this experiment is to look at how far can you go literally with 195 square feet, so that would be 20 square meters, um, sort of in European metrics, um, for a family of four to have to actually procure all of their energy. So there's solar energy, all of their food, and to purify their water on site. So we're not saying with this experiment and with this demonstration uh, that this should obviate the, or alleviate the state from the requirement of having to uh, of having to deliver um, uh, clean air and um, water and and um, and energy, secure energy. But this is merely a, a kind of demonstration uh, to show if you had to do all of those things with a very very small module what could you do with existing and emerging systems, right? So there's, um, in this case, I'll just show this as an example, but you can look at it for more. Um, in this case, uh, this, this system here is showing the, um, the purification of the air and the water through food growing plants. So it's a kind of a bio wall that goes all the way down uh, to the lower level. Um, on the outside of this module, as I showed from the very first picture, there's a, um, there's a farm wall on both sides that is also procuring food. And if you click on, um, if, you, if you want further information on this project, you can see um, from our booklet that um, uh, in terms of the metrics, we were able to show that even in a kind of hostile climate, in this case, it was New York City, um, hostile growing climate, meaning that it's a very extreme climate and we have a very restrictive growing season, which is why we were really looking at the, the, the issue of also indoor air, uh, sorry, indoor uh, vegetation. Um, we were showing that with that wall, you can actually, um, with that exterior wall, the two exterior walls, you can get up to thousands of um, uh, servings of, I think it was over 4,000 servings of, of, of high um, uh, nutrient density food um, for a family of four. So we're covering almost 260 days out of the 365 um, days of the year if you were to um, account for four servings of fruit and vegetable per person per day. So it's far more, for example, than they would normally have, um, you know, in the condition that within which they're living. So what this experiment really was, was as an instance, as an example, if we were to radically, as we said, reinvent the DNA of the built environment towards really trying to sustainably live with the ambient resources that we have for energy, uh, in this case, this very small module is energy positive. It produces 3kW uh, uh, per day. It's a 3kW unit, so it's, it's basically energy surplus for the family of four. They can then sell their energy. 
Um, it's also uh, water positive um, in this particular climate it's because we're doing many things, uh, both um, collecting rainwater and also collecting ambient uh, water from the air and delivering for potable water purposes. And then finally, of course, um, there's the food and the air quality and the kind of condition within which we live. So it's kind of like an experiment within which uh, we're now going to have multiple sites. We are, we are, we were planning sites in Nairobi, also in Accra, in West Africa, and in in South Africa, in Cape Town, um, imminently, and in Central America and Guatemala will be the upcoming sites for different ELMs. Um, and what you will see is with the upcoming ELMs, they won't look anything module because this module is looking at um, material life cycle for the northeastern United States so we use timber because we have a, a sustainable timber industry um, we would use very different materials and very different shape morphologies in order to collect sun and to um, gestate water and, and 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 food in other climate types um, so that's also the last thing that I will say to you is that the specificity of a healthy environment for um, occupants where they're really living with natural rhythms and nature-based solutions uh, towards clean energy, water, air, and material life cycle um, will be very specific to the culture and the climate within which it sits. Um, thanks. Thank you very much. Now that you were talking about the plants uh, in your last uh, sentences, are those also the things that protect in biodiversity and yeah? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, we thought about this a lot. What do you do in an environment that is fully covered in concrete? That is the environment within which many of us have spent our lives and raised our kids in, in Manhattan. And so, um, you know, I think that, you know, introducing um, living species is the first thing to get started, that we really have to activate all of our non-living surfaces with living processes. Um, and so that would be the first step. But as our friends in forestry will say, it can't just be any old species or any old tree. We have to be very cognizant of what are the native ecologies and the issue of invasive species is also a big issue in urban ecologies. And how can we you know, really uh, design with biodiversity and with sustainable ecosystems too. So I think that's another big new thing in the interdisciplinary, as you said, um, is that in the future, we're not just going to have engineers and architects design cities and, and we have landscape architects already, but we, we need to go even further and have you know, microbial ecologists and plant physiologists and forest, foresters and others, you know, urban forestry uh, to, at the table to really plan our future communities with biodiversity. Thank you. I will head over to Hannah for questions from the audience. Yeah, hello. Thanks a lot for your presentation. Um, we have a question in the chat about um, when you talk about the DNA of our built environment, the medical metaphor is already there. So what, which role do health arguments really play in the process of implementing different projects? Yeah. That's a great question, and I'm, I'm sorry that I had some technical, I was having some connection issues, so I didn't show the data. Um, we're interested ourselves in reevaluating completely uh, built environment processes through the lens, not just of human health and well-being, but even, for example, how are the soil microbes doing? or how are the other species doing? So we're, we're measuring the health and well-being of both human and non-human living species in order to drive future systems. That's a very big departure, right? Because we've had other drivers in the past uh, for the built environment and what we do in the built environment, uh, largely over the centuries defense and other things that, you know, that have nothing to do with necessarily how human beings are doing um, and, and human bodies are doing. So um, health and well-being, for us, our primary drivers. Um, that's how we look at it. So when we're gathering data for how the systems are doing, we're also simultaneously always gathering biometric data. Um, in the case of plants, for example, we have multiple experiments. Uh, we have one large experiment in the Bronx where um, we are also testing respiratory rate, heart rate, um, uh, cortisol, analyze all the stress hormones. Uh, we also have a lot of questionnaires on, um, um, on how people are, are feeling. Um, we are testing executive functioning skills as well and other cognitive science measures. Um, and, and basically we can see already certain changes only within an hour of introducing plant-based air um, into environments that previously were completely mechanically ventilated. Um, and this is in 20 something subjects. 
it's really quite something. We're not even sure what the significance of the data is yet, but this is what we're seeing. And it's early days yet because we've been at it, you know, for a few decades on the environmental engineering end. And now, you know, that we're more and more, uh, this is one of the reasons we moved over to Yale just a few years ago, we're new to Yale, but we are working very closely with medicine and, and, um, and school of nursing and school of public health as well on these measurements and setting up these new types of test beds to, to measure. Um, and um, another interesting for, for, I think, the health field is how much, for example, emergency rooms or other types of uh, medical facilities can really be these extreme um, and very, very rich uh, environments for acquiring data on that relationship between literally things like light spectrum or thermal stress or other things because you have multiple bodies in the same, for, get, for example, an operating theater where um, uh, different subjects almost are at the extreme in terms of their requirements. You know, somebody who has an open heart uh, is maybe going to die of hypothermia and their, their um, uh, clinicians are, are, are hovering around them maybe almost in heat stress. So, you know, just as an example, um, you know, of, of the sort of range of requirements within a very, very tight space. I think those are, I think healthcare delivery settings are very extreme in some cases. Um, and for that reason, they're really interesting for us in the research. Thanks. Um, I'll just take another question. Um, there's a question about, is it more sustainable to improve existing buildings or to build new ones outside of cities? Mm -hmm. And um, if it's more sustainable to improve existing buildings, how um, is this to be done? Yeah, that's an amazing question. Um, grosso modo, we would say that like um, in developed, so-called developed economies, I don't really like that term because I don't find it, <laughs> I think that term developed is a loaded one, uh, but in let's say overbuilt, if you will, <laughs> uh, societies, um, most of what we see, if you're living in a city out your window will be there, right, in a hundred years. So so-called retrofit of existing building in cities and stock is extremely important. It's probably primary in very well developed um, uh, cities. Uh, so th that's key. Um, and so it's very, it really depends on the situation as to what's more sustainable. Where we work and one of the reasons we do work in emerging economies um, in the global south, for example, is because they have a window to avoid what we call dumb 20th century infrastructure, <laughs> but it's a very rapidly closing um, window. They have the opportunity with a massive amount of rural to urban migration, for example, or climate and conflict migrants um, that are in very, very large cities, literally, that, that are, are not, not permanent. I mean, they don't have any infrastructure to, that is secure at the moment. Um, and some of them on average will live there uh, um, on average 18 years. So it's a, a, they, they will spend maybe their childhoods or their lifetimes in these uh, encampments. Um, the, uh, there's an opportunity there to really rethink the multi-scalar relationships between infrastructure delivery for all of these different systems that we know of and let's say individuals or individual housing units or, or, or office units or other things. So um, given that we have that opportunity, I think that um, really trying to radically rethink, um, reinvent the wheel, if you will, um, is, is, is important. Um, so I think both situations are important for climate change, obviously, and for, for um, uh, health and well-being and, and preservation of biodiversity. Um, we have that whole range, and it's all important. Not a great answer, but <laughs> I would say it depends on the situation. Thank you. Do we have another question, Hannah, or shall we? Loads of questions. The question is more, do we have time for them? <laughs> yeah. I'll, so I'll just take another one and then... One more and then. Yeah. Okay, so um, could you comment on gentrification? Because um, there were people commenting about um, people disliking community gardens or low traffic areas or new things within their cities um, and how this is to be tackled. Oh, that's interesting. Um, hmm. Uh, well, on the subject of community gardens, I always find that people love them where we're where we are, but maybe that's not true everywhere. Um, I'm not sure what the politics, the situational politics are there, but um, but the issue of gentrification, yeah, is a very is a huge one. I mean, I, one of the things that also we talk a lot about is there's no possibility to have environmental justice if you don't have social justice. So you know they're they're absolutely twinned. 
And, um, you know, we, we absolutely have, maybe the word just should be in everything that we do because we, we justice is probably at the core of, of, of it all. Um, you know, how we treat each other, how we treat other, you know, living things is, is sort of part and parcel. And so, um, I, I think that that is, issue of gentrification is a complex one and it's very, very obviously lo locally and culturally dependent. Um, so how you might, how we might tackle this in New York, maybe not how you can tackle it in Germany or other places. Um, I'm sure that you have much better <laughs> regulations for this in Germany than we do. We have a very serious problem with some of these things in certain cities like San Francisco is a poster child for that where people really cannot even live there anymore. It's, it's become so kind of drastic in terms of just um, pushing the majority of people out really. Um, I think that that's a cultural, it's like a deep cultural question that maybe goes on beyond the biophysical, yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Hannah. Thank you very much, Anna. We actually like really yeah. open and inclusive because my, my dog also was already on our like, <laughs> so don't worry. Sorry. About he him. was quiet all day. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so thank you very much for uh, okay. joining us. And thank you so much. Thank you very much again, Anna. Sylvia is going to introduce Olga and then you will talk later. So you're a professor of the Department of Public Health, actually, on another continent that I am currently on, and uh, it's uh, South America. It's the school of, let me wait, Universidad de los Andes, in kind of Spanish pronunciation, in Bogota, Colombia. And Bogota is really well known also for its initiatives on uh, urban health, actually. For many years, you already have this car-free Sunday. So um, I think like from times when in Europe, some cities couldn't even think about having a car-free day. So it's really also a champion in this area. And you're also a member of many different societies on urban health, like the International Society of Physical Activity and Health, and also International Society of um, Urban Health. And I was wondering when you travel to a new city, if you sometimes wonder like, oh, they could do differently this thing or that thing or also, uh, yeah. Does your job follow you on your travels? Yeah, it does actually. Actually, I try to study what they have. Like if they have a free car Sunday, I will visit that. And uh, I think we all try to learn from other places. Um, I especially like to observe how community interact in the dis if different uh, programs. That's something that is very appealing to me. So I haven't been in, in Germany. I would love to to, to see your, your city because it's also a biking city you referent. But I also like the chaos, uh, which is where I live. <laughs> That's how we, we, we live here in, uh, in Bogota, which we have a lot of traffic, but also we have a lot of uh, community programs. And one of those community programs and in, uh, implementation is what I'm gonna be showing today. Yeah, I'll hand over to you. You can start directly actually. Okay. And as a hint, it's something like people from Austria know as well, but you kind of implemented it somewhere else. The exactly. cable cars, I mean. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Sylvia. Thank you for the invitation. Can you see well my presentation? Yeah. Yeah, Good. See. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. So today, um, Sylvia asked me to present a community program, something different from the car free uh, Sunday car free days or ciclovias, which is what we what we call it here in uh, Bogota. So today I'm going to be talking about a, an urban uh, program, a uh, transportation system, but a transportation system that had also an urban transformation. So this project, uh, which is called Trust, is a project that is part of the Salur Ball study funded by the Wellcome Trust. And I will be showing you a little bit of the impact evaluation from the perspective of public health of the implementation of this cable car that you see here. And also it was implemented in this area of the city. It's uh, one of the poorest and more violent areas in the city of, um, it's actually a self-built uh, environment. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started. First, I'm gonna provide a little bit of context, the global context of cable cars. Um, cable cars have been in the world from 
many years uh, for, since the 1960s, you see cable cars all over the world. But I think the innovation from Latin America and specifically from the case that I'm going to be showing is when a cable car was linked to the mass transit system for the providing access to the poorest populations. And that was the case in 2004 in a city that is called Medellin. And the newest cable card, which is the source of our evaluation, is this one. It's called Transmicable. That is the cable car in Colombia, in Bogota, our capital city. Uh, it was inaugurated in 2018. Um, it has a length of 3.43 kilometers. It connects the poorest population that we have in the city with the mass transit system. Um, daily before the pandemic, we have about on average 21,000 passengers per day. So for the first year of inauguration, it was about 7.5 million people who really use this uh, system. During the pandemic, it reduces a little bit to 15,000, but now we have it again on about 21,000 because these are populations that need this public transit despite the pandemic. I think the most interesting thing of this uh, cable car is that it's not only the implementation of a transport system within the concept of social urbanism, it's also a project that has an important urban transformation. So this project has at least 16 urban projects uh, that include, for instance, local markets, renovation of urban parks, um, citizen uh, service offices and administrative services for the community, uh, also many community centers for many uh, age groups in the community. So when we saw the implementation of the cable car and within our solar bulb project, we saw a window of opportunity for an impact evaluation of a natural using a natural experiment. So what we did was to assess the effect of Transmicable, our cable car implementation on environmental and social determinants of health, physical activity, health outcomes. But we also recognized that it was not only important to use these epidemiologic um, methods, but we also need Needed, um, citizen science qualitative measurements to better understand the uh, barriers and the enablers that our study population could have for their well-being and for health. So this is what we design. It's a natural experiment. Here uh, you have you see well, here here you have the intervention group which is Ciudad Bolívar here, we have the control group, which is gonna be the next cable car for the city of Bogota. And we evaluated uh, these uh, households within this, this buffer of 800 meters. So we did a baseline evaluation and then we also conducted a post evaluation uh, about six months, six months to one year after the implementation. So here you see, this is the cable car. This is the population that it serves and a little bit of results, both from the qualitative and the qualitative component. So um, for quantitative component, Thousand surveys from um, the intervention group and 1,000 surveys from the control group. And we had had so far a response rate of about 82%. So who is this study population that serves this new cable car in their control group? So we had in our study population adults who are about 45 years old, mostly females. Um, in terms of education, most of our population in the intervention group have only elementary school or less. Um, in the control group, it's uh, they also have high school, but it's still it's a population with low education. In terms of income, as I said previously, these are the poorest population. So um, we have um, like about 50% that in our intervention group that lives with um, a minimum wage or less than a minimum wage. It's a little bit higher um, the population who lives with more than a minimum wage in their control group, but still a very poor population. So what happened in terms of mobility? So here in this picture, this is the evolution of the mobility in the area. This is a graffiti that was conducted as part of this transformation that we see in the area. So back in the 80s, they used a donkey, then you use the jeep, then they use the public transportation, and lately uh, we have our cable car. 
So what happened with this population? This, po this population is a non-car dependent population. About 90% of our population use the public transit. Uh, this is what we have before the implementation of the cable car. After the implementation of the cable car, about 12% became regular users. Um, we don't see changes in the control group. They still are using the public transport. Uh, but um, also we asked the population, have you used the cable car? So about 76% of the population have used the cable car. Main reasons is because of time. So it used to take uh, them uh, about one hour from the farther place, the farther neighborhood to the mass transit. Now this reduces to about 19, 20 minutes. So it's an important reduction. That's actually the main reason of why they use the car, the cable car, the access and the time and also they feel a little bit more safe but there's some population that are not using in it about 24 percent and it's mainly because uh, they don't have the access to the cable car or because they are afraid of the altitude the heights so what happened on average on the decreased time of this mobility? So on average, we see a decrease, an important decrease. Um, these are different uh, neighborhoods that are in different uh, distances from the mass transit. So it's an average decrease of 22 minutes. It's significant for transport being the highest on the waiting time. So it's also a system that it's a little bit more regular. But um, what actually concerns us is that uh, it decreases the time, but it decreases the time more for men than for women. We see a disparity between males and females, we see a highest reduction among males, both for the overall time and for the waiting time. Now for the walking time actually increases a little bit among uh, females, it's just about uh, six minutes. So that was in terms of the mobility, but what happened with the physical activity? As I said, there was an urban renovation. This is one of the parks that had the main urban renovation. So. Um, to evaluate that, we use objective measurements, accelerometry, and also we did a systematic observation on the parks to see to what extent we see more people physically active after this urban renovation. So here in this graph, what you see is um, basically um, the patterns of uh, physical activity, moderate to vigorous physical activity minutes, which is what is very important for your health. And we see that the users of the cable car are the most active, uh, being males more active than females compared to those who use the private transportation or the other public transportation. But what happened on what we observe in the parks? So these are the parks that were evaluated from, from time zero to time one. We see an increment of the individuals who were doing more physical activity in the parks. And very importantly, um, because of the perspective of gender that we also give to this project is that the park that has all the higher renovation, uh, we observe more females also uh, doing physical activity in this park. So that was related to physical activity, but what happened with the air quality after the implementation of these cable car? This is an electric transport system. It has solar panels. Um, so what we evaluated to better assess the uh, air quality of the area were microenvironments. So we assess pollutants in microenvironments. So the first thing that we observe is that there was a reduction in the exposure according to the microenvironment. So here we have the cable car after the implementation. So initially we see that pedestrians were the ones who were less exposed to um, a, these pollutants. But then we see that, especially for black carbon, there is a decrease in, the, in especially the cabins of the cable car. But we went farther and says, okay, so what is the inhale doses, which is what really will be uh, important for your health. So we also see that in these cabins, uh, we see an inhale dose that it's really lower compared to what we see on the feeders, which run with diesel or even the pedestrians or the other public transport that runs also with diesel. And this is an important reduction that we see. But at the same time, we recognize that the cable car is a feeder, it's a feeder of the system. So we need to take into account the whole 
whole trip. So here, for instance, uh, we compare what happened for those who use the feeder with diesel and they go to the BRT that also has diesel or gas uh, versus those who use the cable car. And we see an important reduction of the inhaled dose through these trips, which is important for your health. Still, we have higher uh, problems, high problems with our air pollutants, but we are seeing that this type of transport system also decreases the inhaled dose in these microenvironments. But lastly, and I think many of you who are from urban planning, we want to know about the well-being, the quality of life of the population. Does this change what happened after this uh, transport system was implemented and all this urban transformation? So for this, we use uh, the WHO questionnaire. And what we observe is the following. Here in these um, graphs on red, you see the scores for women. And on uh, yellow, you see the scores for men. So on average, what we see usually in our studies is that women have lower scores on quality of life. But the interesting thing within this um, intervention is that after the implementation of the cable car and some of these urban transformation, we see an increase in the scores on uh, women in the intervention group. We don't see that in the for men and we don't see that for the control group, which could be related with uh, the patterns of transport as well as the urban transformation. And at the same time, we assess the perceptions of that they have on safety, on their physical environment. And we see also that on our intervention group, they have higher perceptions of safety, on the satisfaction with the physical environment, and also with satisfaction of the transport, which is very difficult to have in any of our cities in Latin America. And to better understand a little bit um, the perceptions from our uh, participants and to better um, understand how they, they can interact with the stakeholders and policymakers, we use citizen science in order to um, have a qualitative component also in this study. So the first thing we did was to use uh, to collect data through an app, uh, walking with the individuals around the neighborhoods. Then we discuss those pictures they took and the recordings they have about their pictures, then we prioritize with them uh, what could be the main enablers or barriers in their area after the implementation of the cable car. And then we facilitate it through the academia, a dialogue with stakeholders and with policymakers about what they felt uh, was important for this area of intervention. And we monitor the ripple effects, what could happen, things that we probably were not aware of during the design for study and that are important for the community and the stakeholders. So the first thing we did was to have these walks. You see here that for our intervention and control group, we evaluated 45 residents who took 600 photographs and recorded, uh, had 547 audio recorders. Then we discussed with them uh, in this participatory um, process with them uh, the most important things uh, that were enablers or barriers. So for instance, uh, for them, safety is always a problem, especially before the implementation of the cable car. After the implementation, safety was not the most salient, it's still there as a problem, but the most important thing were uh, the quality and the, of the sidewalks and how they proud they feel about their neighborhoods and of course their travel time. Then after we um, had uh, that discussion and that analysis of our population, we facilitated a dialogue with policymakers from the Urban Development Institute, the Ministry of Health, our BRT system, and the sports and recreation. And we um, convened um, meetings with individuals from the control and the intervention group uh, to talk with them and to uh, to see the perspectives that they have. And that articulation was very useful to um, provide input on new programs for the intervention group, to provide input to the control group. How was it all this implementation and to better understand their barriers and their enablers. 
And finally, we try to analyze everything through a ripple effects methodology um, to understand what are the most important uh, aspects on for these uh, uh, groups in terms of after the implementation of the cable car. And again, issues of safety, travel time, programs in parks, and also the pride and how much they feel uh, that now they how how now they um, feel that uh, her their uh, neighborhoods have a better um, better infrastructure. So in conclusion, just uh, to end here, uh, what we found, and we have a multidisciplinary group, so uh, what we discuss usually with our transport and urban planners is that we need to see this intervention on public transportation and urban transformations, that they are very useful and they go beyond the mobility from point A to point B. It's so important to take into account all this transformation around these mobility interventions, these transport interventions. We uh, we see as short effects, uh, short term effects, uh, obviously the reduction of travel time, that's very positive, more satisfaction with transportation and the physical environment, the levels of physical activity, which is very important for the health, are higher among the users of uh, the cable car, we see more women in the park doing physical activity, we see a reduction on air pollutants, uh, they inhale those of air pollutants because we have a more clean uh, transport system and very importantly we see that health related quality of life increase among females at the same time i think we think using the citizen science approach we were able to hear the voices of our citizen scientists the voices were heard also by the policymakers. so we think that these joint um, efforts between academia community and policymakers, which are very hard to do but they could be done within these research projects really help us to better understand these programs to help in the replicability of this program it's going to help for another urban projects in the city and overall to better understand interventions that provide more sustainability and equity Lastly, if you want to see, for instance, a video of the community, Silvia has provided that for you. It has subtitles in English because it's in Spanish. Uh, our protocol was already published. And if we want, you want to know more of our Salar Ball project, you can also check this website. We also have uh, policy briefs that have been very useful for our stakeholders and policymakers. Thank you very much. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you very much for your presentation. The link for the video, you can find the material that Sophie creates every two weeks for you. And we can also send it to you in the next newsletter, actually, that would be really nice, a link. So it's my pleasure to now introduce Thomas Mattweiter. He's the director of urban planning in the city of Vienna. And, uh, the city of Vienna in many rankings is the number one uh, city on livability. But what is even more impressive for me is that in the last year I had three sessions on uh, urban development and traffic and so on and so forth and in each of the kind of conferences one speaker was invited from Vienna so you are seen to be on the forefront of uh, a city developing in the direction of sustainability and uh, uh, you are also uh, the key project uh, of yours is, is to implement Vienna smart city concept um, as a starting question, I, you might be aware that within planetary health, we have three kind of guiding dimensions or challenges. One is uh, the, the knowledge challenge, the second is the implementation challenge, and the third is the imagination challenge. So you are focusing on the implementation challenge. What I'm most kind of intrigued by in the last uh, contribution now from Anna is how much what she is doing and how she's working uh, in, in, in uh, uh, so yes, but also in the emerging countries, uh, how much she is stretching our understanding of what a city, what uh, kind of places can look like and how radical we can be in reimagining what is possible. So my question to you as a starting point is when you started in your career as a urban planner, um, kind of, did you have any imagination of where you would end now and what you would work on and what discussions we have? Uh, thank you. It's, it's, it's a really great question. Uh, thank you for, for inviting me. Uh, no, no, uh, I didn't imagine, <laughs> but, but it's not the end for me, I hope so, uh, at, at this moment. 
Uh, and and to, to go to, to your question, I'm, I always joke and say, uh, I'm not a member of Church of Scientology, I'm a member of the Church of Appliantology. And, uh, but I also would say, uh, and I think this is the point you, you want to stress, uh, we really have a, a problem of, of less imagination and, and of less visions. And I think uh, uh, when, we, when we talk, uh, how, can, how we can tackle the problem of, of climate change, uh, then always the people are, are, are talking about uh, the things uh, which they think uh, what they are losing. And I think this is, this is quite the wrong story uh, because we have to, to, to think and to talk about the new things, the better things, the better world, the, the, the better environment. Uh, and I think for me as, as an urban planner, uh, urban planning in, in the 21st century, uh, century is it's, it's not uh, a, uh, first, a technical job. Uh, it's a communication job, uh, and and you you have to help the people and you have to help the the, the, the politicians uh, to create new visions and and to believe these visions and to talk about these visions. And and uh, I would say this is the first and last step to change the world. Yeah. So we are very uh, excited to have you here with us and uh, are very interested to see what you're going to present us. What is the story of Vienna? Yes, thanks a lot. Uh, I'm talking about uh, the question as smart cities, the solution. Next slide, please. And there you have to ask the question, what makes a city truly smart? Or I would, would say, uh, first you have to discuss what's your picture of a city. Is a city uh, something like a commuter or is a city something like a technological system or is a city for you a social system? And from the viewpoint of Vienna, I can say uh, a city is quite a, a social system. Next slide, please. Yes, as, as I tried to mention, for many cities, a smart city stands for a high-tech gadget wonderland as and it's itself. Next, please. Uh, and from Vienna's perspective, a smart city can also be a very traditional city watching out for future generations. So I love it uh, to talk about a wise city, for example, not, not uh, primarily from a, a, about a smart city. Next, please. And so uh, a smart city has to establish new forms of governance, new forms of, of, uh, of, of involving the, the stakeholders. So a smart city must be a city which makes room for private initiatives. You can hear, see here Barclays in Vienna, for example. Next, please. And uh, for us in Vienna, and I, I would say this is one of the USP uh, of Vienna is a, a smart city audience must be a city of solidarity and collective experience. Next, please. Uh, and consequently, a smart city in Vienna must be an, an open city of equal opportunity. Next, please. So, uh, might, you, you might ask me, do we have in Vienna a problem with technology? No, I don't think. Uh, but when we talk, for example, uh, about the digital city, it must be a digital city for everyone. Our vision is no one in Vienna should be left behind. Next, please. And also consequently, uh, for, from our, our perspective, a uh, smart city uh, also, also has to be a sustainable, a green city. Next. And uh, now we are talking about who develops the city or who plans the city. And uh, we say, uh, that the city, a smart city, uh, has to make affected residents to particip participating, uh, participating citizen. Next, please. And uh, so, a smart city uh, can be a city facing uh, the climate crisis with open eyes. You know, uh, you have seen such pictures like this. Uh, these are the annual mean temperatures in Vienna starting 
70-75 and I think you can get the point of this uh, of this picture. Next, please. Vienna has seriously problems uh, with the heating in the city. Uh, what you can see uh, is the number of tropical nights in Vienna. On the left side of this picture, you can see the present situation. And on the left side, you can see two different scenarios. Uh, the, uh, a, a scenario uh, where we are assuming great efforts in climate protection and below this uh, with assuming low efforts. And I have to say that the effects in Vienna will be dramatically uh, because uh, one example, in the moment we have, uh, we have uh, 0 0.7 nights tropical nights in Vienna and uh, in the scenario of low efforts in climate protection uh, we will get uh, uh, in, in the maximum four to three uh, tropical nights in Vienna. This, this is very, a very, very big difference uh, to the situation now. Next slide please. And uh, so we started to create, create a new strategy. It's our smart city framework strategy. Next slide, please. And uh, this uh, strategy has two or three key elements. Uh, the one element is normal, I would say, for smart cities. It's, it's the field of innovation. But in, in Vienna, it's not only technological innovation. It's all, it's, we, we also emphasize the field of social innovation. Very essential for us is the resource preservation. I would say minus 85% CO2 emission till 2050. And last but not least, the USB of Vienna quality of life to keep the quality of life in this city. Next, please. Uh, so we have, uh, we need a massive reduction of greenhouse gas em uh, emissions in Vienna. Next slide, please. And there we have a very complex strategy. Uh, we have, we have to, uh, to reduce the energy consumption in the city, clearly. Uh, we have uh, to, to shift a bit our behavior, but uh, as I tried to, uh, to, to, to stress at the beginning, uh, this can be a better world for us. It's, it's not a, a problematic world. And we have to tell to, 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 uh, to uh, create this story together with the people. Next slide, please. There we are acting in a lot of fields, uh, energy, mobility, buildings, digitalization, economics and labor market, for example, wastewater management, environment, health, uh, social inclusion, education, science and research and participation. Next slide, please. One of the strong points in Vienna, I would say, is the mobility sector. Uh, Vienna is a city with uh, more or less 2 million inhabitants. And in the current situation, only more or less 27% of all trips are done by, by private cars in Vienna. This is the current situation. And our goal is uh, to reduce this, uh, this share in the, in the model split uh, from 27, 28% to 20%. Next slide, please. This is one of the central places in Vienna. It's the St. Stephen's place. Uh, it's the St. Stephen's place uh, in the uh, 1950s. Next slide, please. And this is the situation now. No cars there. And I would say it's a better, better situation for the people. Next slide, please. Uh, so we have a, a very uh, strong pro program uh, to foster decentralized centers as focal points of vibrant city life in the city. Next slide, please. There we have uh, three strong points on our agenda. Uh, we have to uh, 
refurbish the established centers, we try to develop new centers, and we have to regulate the large scale retail uh, conglomerates. Next slide, please. Yes, and, and uh, the pol politicians also in Vienna always ask me, uh, is it allowed? Uh, is it uh, allowed to the people to, to own private cars? Because the idea of the politicians is that the, the, the citizen in the city, they only want to drive private cars the whole day. And I think this is really interesting because we ask the people, do you really need a private car for a private mobility? Is it necessary to own a private car in Vienna? And believe it or not, 90% of the people in Vienna say, no, it's not necessary to own a private car. Yes, I know a lot of them in the moment own a private car, but from the mindset, they understood that uh, it could be a better world uh, for them also in the city without a private car. Next slide, please. And so I think uh, in the mobility sector of a smart city, it's necessary to ask the right questions. In the moment, you are talking about electrification in the city uh, from the cars. You are talking about the automation of the cars. You are talking about the sharing. And, and everyone uh, thinks that, that his solution is the solution for the whole mobility problems. I would say, yes, electrification is nice. But at the end of the day, a car is a car is a car. Or the electric car is a car. Automation, yes, nice. But at the end of the day, uh, it could be more easy for the people to drive a car. What will be the result? More cars or less cars? And if we have more cars in the city, this can't be a good solution for us. So uh, for us, from the, uh, this uh, three alternatives for us, sharing is the most interesting thing. And that this is a social innovation that more people are using cars and they don't own the cars. And so this can be an example for me how we try uh, to solve the problems in Vienna. Next slide, please. Uh, what's good for us that uh, between the two key action fields, climate protection on the one hand and adaptation to the climate change on the other hand, we have a wide field, wide field of synergies. Next slide, please. Uh, from the from the aspect of 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 of, uh, uh, of uh, adaptation to the climate change. Uh, it's, it's absolutely clear, uh, we have to green the city, uh, we have to bring water to the city, uh, we, ha we have to cool the city. Next slide, please. And uh, for us, uh, climatology must become, or must uh, get a, a, become a, a basis for urban planning. I think in the moment we, we have not enough knowledge in this field but uh, it's absolutely essential for us to bring the cool air in the city, to cool the city in the summer nights, to keep the city as a good place for living. And so at the end of my short presentation, uh, next slide, I can do the conclusion. Uh, the global context for cities is changing rapidly. And uh, I think the climate crisis is, is our biggest problem. We have to change, uh, but we have to know uh, cities are not the problem. Cities are the solution. Uh, Vienna has been redefining uh, the smart city idea uh, by putting the people and the needs in the front and the, the center. Uh, therefore, the basis must be a new form of interaction uh, and cooperation between the city and the citizen. And for us, social innovation is the key towards uh, necessary and a significant reduction of resource consumption. And, and let me add, uh, I talked a lot about the mobility system in Vienna. Uh, if you have a city uh, a walkable city, a, a city which uh, is attractive for people to walk uh, or, for example, to cycle, uh, 
this is on the one hand good for the resource consumption, but on the other hand, it's absolutely essential for the human health and well-being. Uh, we have uh, done a, a social research with very clear uh, results uh, that uh, the people without cars, uh, uh, the, the people the, which don't own cars, private cars, the people which walk a lot, with cycle a lot, are the healthiest uh, citizen in a city and uh, the more lucky people and the more satisfied people in the city. So thank you. And uh, if you have any questions, I, I try to give you answers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Thomas, for a very inspiring um, presentation. I want to put a question to you because uh, I started on your own ability to imagine kind of how could you imagine what you're doing today. For my understanding, I was seeing city and urban city planners more as an engineering discipline. Now we have clearly redefined it as a social discipline because putting social innovation as the core of urban development of the smart city in itself is kind of beyond what most people would imagine. So perhaps you want to comment on this. Is this quite a radical uh, kind of re redefining and re re kind of giving a new perspective to it? Perhaps you want to start to comment on this. I think you are, you are absolutely at the point. And this picture uh, or this role of urban planners changed dramatically. Uh, if you compare uh, <laughs> pictures uh, from urban planners from the 50s, I think this is very interesting. Uh, mostly this had been men, and these men are, are designing something, yes, uh, clearly experts, yes. And they are the experts, and they know what's the problem, and they know what's the solution, and they try to establish the solution. And now we know that uh, the field of urban planning, it's, it's, it's so complex. You have such a lot of aspects. The first thing is that you know that you can't know everything. It's not your job. You, you have to know uh, how to organize the process to, to, to get a solution. And I think this is the essential point for, for urban planners. You have to bring the, the people with their knowledge together. You have the people with the, to, to bring the people with their local knowledge together. And uh, we, you, you, it's, it's absolutely necessary uh, that, that you are able to, to establish co-creation processes. And uh, I think uh, this is at the beginning, at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's a question of your private mindset. Are you open for this? Yes, and, and I think this is, this is necessary. And, 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 and if we are uh, uh, for new colleagues, this is the first question I ask them. Do we want to act with the people or do we have a problem with this? I would, uh, I would have a question to the two of you actually, because there's this healthy city network, which has <laughs> been announced, initiated already, I think either in the end of the nineties or beginning of 2000. What, and it kind of like got lost on the way somehow and got forgotten. Do you think that this time now with facing the climate crisis and like more like more dramatically it will change the situation and kind of reinitiate this network because i mean I, this idea yeah. already years before that's what i want to say like yes i, I think so yes I, I think this this could be a a, a good point and it, i think it's 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 a realistic goal yes absolutely Yeah, I think it is. And it's not only, I mean, the pandemic also put into place the importance of urban planning and the importance of working with many sectors, as, as Thomas said, and the importance of the co-creation with the community. I think in, in cities, like uh, with a lot of violence, like what we see in Latin America, uh, bringing the community and providing the community appropriation is so important. So uh, the community can also make uh, changes and can also um, value all these uh, all these changes in transport and urban transformation they are having. So I think I will say the co-creation, as Thomas said, is so important and the community appropriation within windows of opportunities are going to be very important. 
So should we take a few questions from the audience, Hannah? Yeah, Hannah, I think so. For both of you and also um, Olga and Hannah, you want to comment on each other, you are free to do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we have loads of questions. So um, what were the biggest challenges you faced in implementing projects and how did you overcome them? And then also, um, what about opposition from citizens or politi politicians, or maybe even downsides from your point of view um, in the projects you were able to realize? I think that's more for Thomas, who is the implementer. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, th I think uh, the, the essential thing is uh, uh, to, to, to organize uh, successful projects, uh, first point is you, you have to, it's, it's necessary to have a common vision. You, it's, it's necessary that uh, uh, a city must also, at, at the one hand, you, you have to be the open for, for participation and cooperation, absolutely. On the other hand, I'm, I'm always argumenting that uh, it's also necessary that a, a city uh, acts uh, in, in a strong role of leadership. And there, the first step must be that, that the city has to know what's, what's their role, what's their goal. Yeah? And uh, for this background, it's, 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 a, lot, it's a lot easier uh, to organize uh, successful uh, projects. And then uh, I would say it's, it's necessary to, to find uh, all the relevant stakeholders and in the past, mostly the problem was that uh, some essential stakeholders uh, was not part of the planning process of, or of the implementation process. And then you have a problem at the end. Yeah. I think Hannah, I will add from the experience of the case I presented, um, I mean, I don't know how long it takes in your cities to implement many of those projects. In Colombia, it takes a lot of time. It could be from one government to another one. So in this case, the funding was from the previous government and the government that needed to implement it was not quite sure they wanted to implement it. So in that sense, the community was a key factor. And they said, um, you, uh, the previous government promised that, they had a coalition, they went and talked to the council. So we could never underestimate the power of our communities, our women who have, I mean, in the case I show you is in informal settlements. They have to fight for everything, for the water, for the sewage, for the, for the sidewalks, everything. So I think um, a good um, alliance with the community, which is what we are promoting for the next cable car, having the community participation, hearing their voices is key for successful projects. Absolutely. Uh, I would say that uh, the civil society or the in involving of the civil society, civil society uh makes uh the implementation of urban development projects uh, more stable or more successful than uh, absolutely uh uh like olga mentioned uh urban development uh, uh projects are mostly long-term projects we are talking about five to ten years and uh we we have new elections every four or every five years and so uh uh, we are much stronger with with uh, if if you have the the citizen with us. Yeah, absolutely. I want to add one thing. You were pointing to the the importance of including all relevant stakeholders. This also yeah. means that the stakeholders need to educate themselves and kind of enlarge their role. So we health professionals need to also see us as key contributors to city development because it's the key factor and determinant of the health of the citizens. But we need to learn enough of the language and the key dimensions of city development so that we can participate and actually even push for things that we are seeing, not just wait for participation, but also push for participation and then also share it with our patients and kind of within the health community. So yeah. it requires and enables also a changing of our role, not of everyone, but it kind of there needs to be enough health professionals seeing it as a passion to participate in, in, in city development. Now, I would say that, that uh, a successful participation is always uh, a, a process of, of learning. 
and of, of learning on both sides. Uh, we are learning from, from the people because they are local experts and we, we are learning what they really need, what their, their, their real needs. But they are also learning something about the complexity of organizing a city. And uh, this is very fruit, fruitful. So uh, if, if you think that participation is, is, is only a process to, to, to create uh, a new project, a bit faster, no, no, no. Uh, you make it more stable. I would say this is the essential point. And I will add, I mean, interdisciplinary projects and then the, when they become um, a really transdisciplinary projects requires to learn so many languages. I mean, so many languages from so many sectors from and you have to ha to be patient and you have to be very respectful because the only th the other thing that i've seen is that with the best of the intentions we could do harm from from the academia we could have unintended consequences so i think it's a process that sometimes our funders from academia do not understand but it takes time it takes a lot of time to get the trust from the community from the stakeholders to really understand the, the project that we are evaluating i, I give you some numbers uh, when I started uh, working at the city of Vienna, yeah, it was more or less uh, 27, 28 years ago. Uh, we had 9% uh, people in Vienna, which was not born in Vienna. Now uh, we have 35% uh, of people in Vienna, which are not born in Vienna. So uh, I see this is a good situation because uh, Vienna become a, a, a much better city in these years, but it's a complex situation because uh, you have a lot of people with with very different uh, historics. Uh, you have to deal with their experiences, uh, and uh, if a planning for a public space, for example, sh should be successfully, you have to involve it. Them. It's, it's, it's at the end of the day, it's their public space. And you have asked them for their needs. It's not your private space, your public space, sorry. Hannah, maybe do we have another question? Yeah, we do. Um, one to Olga. Um, there's this impressive amount of data backing the arguments um, for the cable car project. Um, and to which degree had people hoped for these results before it was built? And were these things the arguments for building it? So actually, so you're asking me for the data or the expectation of the community? No, more those um, who were deciding about it being built. Okay, I mean, so before the the history of the implementation, right? Yeah. Okay, so um, a little bit of history, a little bit of background. So we're talking about the poorest population and the most violent population. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Colombian conflict, which is the one of the largest in the world. So we have an area with all the actors of this conflict. So uh, living up in the hills, May, very poorly connected with the city. So uh, there was a movement of the community inspired by other cities to really uh, advocate for this project. And as I was uh, telling Thomas when we were commenting on the community, I will say that it was an interplay at that time of the community needs and a policymaker and a government that where we have this political will. So that thanks to that, the funding was there. And then having a community that was already in power with a lot of social capital, that is what we say, a lot of networks, they were able to really bring into place this project. And then during that time, we had this uh, solar ball project and we were looking for windows of opportunities of natural experiments. So it was the good time to, um, uh, articulate a natural experiment and how that's how the academia came into place and uh, but we develop a process with the community and with the stakeholders so it has taken a lot of time a lot of errors that we have made as well because that happens when when you try to understand a natural experiment I mean if you have another one. <laughs> 
Yeah, more positive, uh, maybe for the for the last question. And um, what would you be your dream um, city planning project in the city you were working in to both of you? My the dream? <laughs> well, I think we all I mean, that working um, health and well being, we want to have more pedestrians, more bikers, more use of public transport. Um, I think the uh, uh, the dream in the area where I work with is Latin America, which is I mean, a lot of traffic, a lot of disorder. I mean, it's a chaos. I think one of the dreams will be to um, to have a better articulation with uh, these three systems to promote, to continue walking, continue biking, and probably decreasing more of the motorcycles and the cars. That that will say from the region in Latin America and many of the cities that we see here. Yes, my, my, my dream is, is, is not a technical dream. My, my, my dream is that, that, that Vienna keeps uh, a peaceful city and a respectful city. This is my dream. Thank you very much. We also got a lot of praise actually from the audience for the three of you, like Anna already left, but I just want to share it with you. And I would like to hand over to another person just shortly because actually in Germany, we quite recently also had a petition from a group um, which is called the Architects for Future because they also have their vision of what we could change for a healthier future. Then um, maybe you could just shortly share what your vision is and we will hear from you also next time a little bit more. So as a smart future, so to say. Oh, you're muted still, so we can't hear you. Well, yeah. Thank you very much for inviting us, by the way. Um, we, the Architects for Future, formed last year to promote um, a sustainable transition of the building sector. Most of us are, are young architects at the beginning of their career um, who really want to change something. You want to raise awareness about uh, how big the footprint is of the building sector. About 40% actually of all the uh, carbon dioxide that is uh, blasted into our atmosphere is due to, um, to the building sector, either for the energy that you, uh, that you need to heat the buildings, but also, and this, this is a blind spot for, uh, the crea uh, for the production of the materials. And this is a topic that we've been focusing on a lot, how to, uh, to raise the awareness What's the footprint of the uh, choice? What materials you use in your buildings? Um, so far, there have been um, there have been programs in the German uh, legislation um, that um, that force people to um, uh, to use less energy for heating. But it's been really a blind spot about uh, how um, how much energy is used for the uh, production of the materials. So um, what do we want to change for, um, for the building industry is mainly that people really start to use only materials that, uh, that are healthy, that are non-toxic, so uh, that they are so precious and so valuable that they may be re uh, reused all over and again so that uh, uh, future generations will actually have benefits from the choices that we make today. Um, as I said, our focus has been mainly on materials, but there's a very close link to the choice of materials and health, because um, materials that are toxic, that are not beneficial for the indoor air quality, can will not be re, uh, reused. And so, such materials that could be reused all over again, like clay, for example, or materials that can grow again, like wood, they also have good uh, features to improve indoor air quality, to, to prevent lung diseases, other illnesses. Um, proper building techniques will uh, prevent buildings from being moldy, which is also a health issue. How we plan our cities is something that you've been talking about already quite a lot. It's also something that is um, partly something which um, the building industry is involved in has a lot to do with uh, uh, with public health because of short ways so that pedestrians may um, may do everything within their quarter and are not uh, dependent on using cars, which is again the health issue. So 
Um, anyway, I've been talking <laughs> talking a lot about, about uh, motivation, but what I really want to share with you is that uh, recently we filed a petition at the German Parliament, and um, we've made it. More than fifty thousand people have signed. Say this is this is a small goal that we've reached. At, that we see, okay, we're starting to raise awareness of this topic and. Next week, we really like to share a bit more about this with you because it can be some kind of hope. Because we've been people who didn't have a lobby. We were we were students at well, most of us students or just at the beginning of their professional career, and soon we will be heard at the German Parliament. And yeah, we we would like to share that with you. So. Thank you very much. So maybe we will all sit in buildings like that because Anna Dyson beforehand shared different kind of materials also in 3D printed buildings. So maybe in the future in Germany, all buildings will look like this one. So we'll see. We'll keep you updated, I would say. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much for this different input. I think we saw so many different perspectives, outdoor air pollution, indoor air pollution. You just mentioned it, Jonathan, as well, like how to plan cities, how to plan buildings. And there's so many perspectives where we can positively influence human health. Thank you very much for all this really interesting and valuable input, I would and say. And the health of the, um, the other living species that are sharing the environment with us. It's, it's much about um, making, uh, making cities greener so that even the plant and animal life is also healthy, which is part of a healthy environment. So yeah, I can just putting a lot of focus on that. Thank you. Martin, do you want to say something more? No, there's nothing more to say. Perhaps you want to say a few words for the last session. For the last session, because the last session is the one who's going to about a transformation example. So we're presenting to you our like, People are presenting to you like how to become a zero emission hospital, for example. There's one in Berlin who's decided to become climate neutral until 2030. Also, we're presenting to you a group who's combining environmental protection and human health from Indonesia. We're also having people from, I will need to have to look it up because there's a difference. Ah, people, because elections are upcoming in Germany. Also, how people are engaging and how to influence the positive income and also how to change cities and make them healthier. So if, you, if you're looking for ideas to how you can engage in your society and community, um, stay tuned, I would say, and join us for the next lecture in two weeks. And thank you very much to our speakers and have a nice evening. Thank you very much. <laughs>